All right. So 12 things we learned about Shell in 12 months. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Great. So my name is Hillary Flint. I am an employee of BC Mac, and today um, myself, other BC Mac staff members and board members will share with you what we've learned over the past year. Um, this has been the first year of operations for the Shell Plastics plant in Potter Township, and um, it hasn't gone so well. So we wanted to share some lessons that we have learned. So starting off on, you know, maybe a, a not a super important note, um, we've learned that they're not great about social media. So they've only posted 18 times on Facebook over the past year. And there has not been a single update since the month of July. Despite having hundreds of comments on some of these Facebook posts, they have never responded to a resident question, comment, or concern. Um, so essentially, they're not communicating with their community members. And, you know, to be direct, when, when they were awarded these permits, being a good neighbor and being part of the community was a part of that promise. And um, we are not seeing that, unfortunately. If you would like to check it out for yourself, we'll drop their Facebook link in the chat. Um, but I must admit, it might bring upon some outrage because the the comments that people are asking are very you know valid and people are worried about their health and safety. So for lesson number 11, we've learned that they aren't very dedicated to the community. They had two community events to address various malfunctions at the plant. And they promised to do that quarterly. So in one year, we've only gotten two of those events. And I'm not sure if any of you have ever attended them, but they are set up webinar style. So you can't see any participants. So like how on Zoom right now, I can see all of your lovely faces. That's something you could not see in their webinars. You also could not see the chat feature. You could not see any of the questions being asked. And this style really allows them to pick and choose what questions they answer. And they also have only um, put one of those online. So you can't even view the most recent community meeting that they had. And we'll drop that in the chat so you can you can watch the first one for yourself. Um, but in these webinars, it, it felt like they were speaking at us instead of listening to the very valid questions and concerns about health and safety. Um, so that was, you know, unfortunate. And we have yet to get another one of those community meetings. Um, next up, I'm going to turn it over to the executive director of BC Mac, Hillary O'Toole. Thank you, Hillary. And I have the privilege of um, addressing point number 10. And this, um, this point is very specific um, and has a lot to do with the public. Um, because they will not call people back or update their data in a timely manner. And we feel like we really need to hold them accountable for that as well. Um, we've received various reports uh, that the community hotline phone number that Shell provided, um, that they advertise to call whenever we see something or hear something or smell something in the community, that it's not very helpful. Um, it seems like it's run by an answering service, not locally, uh, nothing to do with the community. Um, and they'll take down questions and concerns, but they don't seem to call residents back with any answers. And that's something that's pretty alarming if you think about it. Um, there have been many instances where our team has been promised a response via email or uh, a return phone call or any type of follow-up information from a Shell employee, and we just never hear back. Um, and then what's even more concerning is that they have not posted a PAMS update PAM stands for Passive Air Monitoring System, um, an update since August 30th. Now, this means that they are required or supposed to, they've, they've committed to providing biweekly passive sampling for chemicals of potential concern in the area. And these chemicals include benzene, hexane, one in three butadiene, and toluene. Um, and to conduct this monitoring, Shell has installed 20 passive air monitoring systems um, in different locations. So we just have not been informed about what we've been exposed to in three months. And I think that that's very concerning. 
Um, the data can't be, or excuse me, can't be accessed by anyone through the link that's posted in the chat right now. And our team is working on getting answers for the community. If Shell will not communicate or educate the community in a timely manner, our organization will. BC Mac is extremely excited to announce that we have a new Eyes on Shell emergency hotline phone number. So you can call us anytime whenever you see something, smell something, hear something um, that has to do with the Shell Cracker plant at 724-503-2614. And please, please keep in mind that anyone can be a part of our Eyes on Shell watchdog team. If you see, smell, hear something that doesn't seem right, please call the number and let us know. You can report via the phone number that was provided via our emails, which are also going to be listed in the chat, or via a direct message on social media accounts. And we'll be sure to drop all of those links and everything in the chat um, if you don't already follow us, which you should. And I am going to pass things along to our board chairman, Bob. Hi, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining us tonight. Bob, I believe you may be muted. How am I doing now? Good. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. <clears throat> and let's talk about the money. Shell has received the biggest tax break in Pennsylvania history, $1.65 billion in tax breaks over the course of 25 years. All Beaver County residents are facing reassessments that could increase their property values in local, school, and Beaver County real estate taxes. Many reassessments have gone as high as 600% in some communities. While Shell Chemical Cracker Plant tax credits are expensive for taxpayers, they promise few permanent jobs, said the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center in Harrisburg. The Resource Manufacturing Tax Credit, which was Act 16 of 2012, enacted in March of that year, exempt Shell from corporate income and property taxes for 15 years. During that time, Shell will likely have unused resource manufacturing tax credits that it will be able to sell for cash, up to $66 million a year for 15 years. Will the taxpayers get the unused tax money back? $66 million a year for 15 years could hold down real estate taxes in Beaver County, Central Valley School District, and Potter Township. Act 16 requires Shell to create 400 permanent jobs to be eligible for the tax breaks. That breaks down to $165,000 per year per job, or $4,125,000 per job over the, the 25 year life of the KOEZ program. That was added to the KOZ program. The construction jobs were temporarily filled by out of state and out of country workers who sent their money home, leaving the Commonwealth taxpayers to pay for Shell's tax breaks. Legislation establishing the tax credit authorizes $66 million in credits each year for 25 years, and that lasts from 2017 through 2042. Shell is not required to create jobs nor commit to other investments to be eligible for the credit. Shell located on polluted brownfield site. All companies who abandoned these sites did not have to clean them up. The new owners would have to, but the state also added an additional incentive to Shell. Clean up the properties, 34 of them at taxpayers' expense, where the country's largest zinc smelter was located. Estimated cleanup cost was in the seven figures. There has been 
and is ongoing special treatment for Shell from the state, according to a review by the Legislative Budget and Finance Committee. There is a spotty track record when it comes to accountability of the KOZ and KOEZ programs, as well as other state tax credit programs. The Hey, Bob, I think you might have um, accidentally muted yourself. Okay, where did I leave off? Um, we missed the last sentence that you, you just shared. Okay. Uh, what is Beaver County, Potter Township, Central Valley School District doing to verify the accuracy of the accounting that they're losing out in tax dollars? The new shell cracker tax credit ends in 2043. The legislation does not require an evaluation of the credit program until it ends three decades from now, severely limiting its accountability and effectiveness. Tax credit programs should be evaluated as stringently as appropriations. And by that standard, the proposed tax credit for shale fails. I hope that helps people to understand a little bit better that we have a state problem that needs to be improved on. <clears throat> and Beaver County Marcellus Awareness community is doing that job. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. And next up, we have uh, BC Mac board member, Marsha. Hi, everyone. This is point number eight. Shell made record profits. They delivered a record $40 billion profit in 2022 as the Shell Corporation, while just paying around $10 million in fines, including to us here in Beaver County, Shell agreed to pay Pennsylvania for exceeding emissions limits during the troubled launch of its massive new plastics plant in Beaver County. You all remember their egregious emissions violations, and we'll get into that a little bit later. The sum that they were fined includes nearly a million dollars. It actually came to $4,935,000 and $2,300 in civil penalties and another $5 million to fund local environmental projects in Pennsylvania. That fine from the DEP was only 0.025 of Shell's profits. Let me repeat that, 0.025 of their profits. So that was like a little slap on the wrist. Point number seven, they haven't improved the local economy, not at all. According to a report by the Ohio River Valley Institute, since 2012, Beaver County actually lost GDP as the state and the country experienced strong and consistent growth. Beaver County actually lost population, while Pennsylvania overall maintained residents and the U.S. population grew steadily. Beaver County trailed the state and the nation in job growth even when factoring in all the temporary construction workers at the Shell site. Beaver County saw its child poverty rate surpass the state's and the country's rates. And Beaver County lost businesses despite Pennsylvania state and national growth. You could read the detailed report at the link that Phoebe is gonna be dropping into the chat. That report is from the Ohio River Valley Institute that I just mentioned. So this is just another egregious example of Shell's false promises. Thank you, Marsha. And next, I'm going to turn this over to our board member, Terry. Thank you, Hillary. This is uh, point number six, that Shell takes a really long time to do things. As many of you know, residents have been complaining about light pollution from Shell's plant ever since construction began. In... Um, there's a link um, that maybe Phoebe can put into the chat, and uh, I want to just go over some of the complaints. 
One resident states, there's been no night here for over seven years. Some nights I put a pillow over my head so the room is dark enough. Some nights you could read a newspaper in my living room. There's so much light scatter. This resident outlined all the ways in which light pollution affects their daily life. First, the flaring illuminates the sky all around our house. Second, the middle light that flashes shines right into our living room. The window was an added cost to our home and now we can't keep the blinds up. Train lights shine directly into my living room windows. The lights below us light up my whole entire bedroom. The stadium light is distracting. That's just a sample of those complaints. What many people don't know uh, now is that during the plant's commissioning period, Shell was supposed to complete a study of the plant's on-site lighting. And though that completed study is the first thing residents need to push back on light pollution from the plant, Shell has been sitting on the results of that study and feeding the public a very strange line about its delay. To explain, in 2017, six years ago, Potter Township enacted Resolution 3-2017 requiring Shell to complete this exterior lighting study as it was called. Resolution 3-2017 says that Shell shall provide to the township an exterior lighting study to be performed during the commissioning period of the facility becoming operational and following the completion of installation of all exterior lights. Now we all know the plant's exterior lights have been installed and before Shell asked for multiple, multiple extensions of its commissioning period, the first such period was supposed to end in October of 2022. The completed Exterior lighting study is essential for pushback on light pollution from the plant for several reasons. First, Resolution 3 2017 refers to a key Potter Township ordinance on light nuisances and glare. Lighting Ordinance 14900, excuse me, 149038 holds that there shall be no direct or sky reflected glare whether from floodlights or from high temperature processes such as combustion or welding so as to be visible from any from within any residential zoning district. And we all know that the Sky Over Shell plant has reflected plenty of highly visible orange and white glare, so visible in fact that BC Mac has taken photographs of that glare for the Potter Township, to Potter Township, for the supervisors to share with Shell. Equally important, the results of the exterior lighting study are essential to push back on the plant's light pollution because Resolution 3 2017 states that the study's results will ensure Shell's compliance with the township ordinance we just discussed. For all those reasons, in May of 2022, I asked Shell if the exterior lighting study had been completed. And in its emailed reply to my question, Shell said then, more than a year and a half ago, that the exterior lighting study was, and I quote, underway. I ask you to hang on to that word underway and that May 2022 date. In the same email, Shell added that the study's results would be delivered to Potter Township by the end of 2022. And Potter agreed to share those results with the broader public, including residents outside its borders. So we waited till the end of 2022 to get those results, but now, Nine months later, they still have not been delivered to Potter Township and the public. Even curiouser, when Potter Township asked Shell for the study results in April of 2023, Shell's response was, it was going to New Zealand to find a firm to do the exterior lighting study. Shell did not say why it was looking for a firm to undertake a study that it had said was underway an entire year before that. The delayed delivery of the exterior lighting study results for nine months beyond the promised deadline is bad enough without the manner in which Shell has communicated about it. So I leave you with these three questions. Why, first, why, under any circumstances, should it take more than a year and a half, a year and a half, to even start doing a study of the plant's lighting, much less to complete it. Second, given its two blatantly contradictory stories, can Shell be believed? And thirdly, is Shell a good neighbor?
So let's go to point five. And that is that Shell um, is permitted to be the second largest volatile organic compound, excuse me, volatile organic compound polluter in the state. And uh, Rachel and Cliff will have more to say about this later, but in terms of its permit, Shell is capped at 516.2 tons of VOC pollution for any 12 month period, but it emitted 510.89 tons in September of 2022 alone before it even started operation. From the beginning, Shell, it was, uh, we knew that Shell was going to be a bigger VOC emitter than the Claret and Coke works. And now, we need to think about the health impacts of those VOCs. In the short term, VOC vapors can irritate the, eye, uh, the eyes, the ears, and the nose and the throat. They can create headaches and loss of coordination. They can contribute nausea. They can contribute to breathing difficulties. Um, possibly they worsen asthma. More exposure can result in liver kidney and central nervous system damage. Some VOCs are carcinogens. Benzene, for example, is a known carcinogen linked to leukemia. Formaldehyde linked to nose and throat cancer and maybe leukemia as well. Um, a third is linked to kidney cancer, a third carcinogen that's a VOC. There are possibilities as well. Some studies have linked exposure to VOCs in the prenatal period to the autism spectrum. Some have linked birth linked uh, exposure to birth defects, such as uh, neurocognitive birth defects and problems with asthma and cancer. When VOCs combine with oxides of nitrogen, or NOx and sunlight, they create ozone. Ozone irritates the respiratory system and causes serious problems with bronchitis, emphysema, and asthma. So all of these health problems, even healthy people, um, ozone creates difficulty in breathing. All of these health problems caused by VOCs are serious cause for concern and they need to be recognized by all of us who are living near this plant. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And, and for those that don't know, Terry has been incredibly vigilant in attending the Potter Township supervisors meetings um, and really just continuous pressure, applying continuous pressure. Um, Dr. Lau does as well. So, uh, you know, major shout out to the BC Mac board who has been doing this work for years because they, they knew this was coming. And, um, you know, I always hate to admit that when someone's right about bad things, but unfortunately that's the case. So we will now turn it over to Dr. Lau to talk more about um, the emissions and pollution piece. Yep, so we're up to number four. <laughs> but I wanted to, besides, as Terry brought up very well, their exceedance of their VOC uh, amount. And I uh, in the thing you see, they've almost doubled it uh, now. But they also have uh, exceeded their, uh, I think Terry mentioned their carbon monoxide, their HAPS hazardous air pollutant, and their uh, nitrogen oxide or NOx. And the important part of bringing that up, Gary uh, mentioned about the uh, importance of ozone. Ozone is a secondary pollutant formed from VOCs and NOx with sunlight, as Gary uh, brought up. But since they're exceeding the two ingredients that make up ozone, uh, that is a very uh, bad issue then. Now we've got 
tons of stuff in the air and with a little bit of sunlight, uh, we can have uh, a lot more ozone than we're used to. So I just wanted to, to bring that point up. And if I had a picture of many of the pictures that we've had of uh, what happens at the plant between, uh, I call it their operation hours of 9.30 p.m. to 9.30 a.m., uh, you might be shocked. Uh, we have uh, through the auspices of the uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon University, two breathe cams that are up. And so therefore we can uh, keep an eye on them. And also uh, you guys call in once in a while or send us emails or uh, social media that might be driving past the plant uh, late at night and uh, see things happening. So uh, uh, why they're doing this, we have no idea. They don't seem to want to answer that. Uh, right now, it's kind of uh, critical because right now we're in the, uh, because of the, uh, of the cold, we have a lot of uh, inversion days with uh, cold air settling in the valley and warm air over the top. And you can see that on the breathe cam with sometimes I can't even see the plant. It's covered in so much uh, fog and haze. But if the fog and haze is being trapped near the plant, then also all the pollutants that the plant is giving out is also being trapped uh, near the plant. So um, this is not the time of season to be doing this if you're really concerned about uh, air pollution and, and being nice neighbors, um, you get much more uh, atmospheric uh, stirring and mixing during the sun, uh, daylight hours. However, then we've asked the DEP to come and do inspections at the after hours. And they said they will, they have to get overtime. Uh, we have not seen any posted results of them doing inspections. Instead, they've uh, done their inspections um, during like 11 o'clock uh, in the morning or one o'clock in the afternoon. And they usually just write up that uh, everything looks fine. Don't notice any malodors. Don't see any visual uh, emissions and uh, no dust coming off the plant. And that's uh, all they get. And then send them photographs and reports of what happened uh, earlier that morning or later that night, uh, but yet uh, they still have not posted uh, any inspection reports of off hours. Uh, so uh, we really want them to do that. Also, um, I forget which one of us brought up that uh, besides Shell not being up to date, the DEP, uh, the last uh, inspection report they published, I think, was in uh, August. They uh, just say that it takes time for them to get them written up and posted, but again, not in a very timely manner. So uh, hopefully uh, with pressure and uh, you guys, when you do see something besides notifying us, if it does have something to do with a smell or flares or vapors, you know, uh, call the DEP hotline number and, and report it. And then uh, if they do get back to you or whatever, let us know, or hopefully they get the idea that they need to come out uh, when things are happening at the plant. And we want also to know uh, what run reports are going on and stuff that, uh, at the plant. So uh, there could be a lot more done as far as keeping uh, having the uh, DEP keep an eye on Shell. We think we do a pretty good job with all the help of uh, you guys, but uh, we need some uh, help from the government. So our, our uh, third one is that uh, if you all remember, Back in April, we had a little incident, as Shell would say, a little whoops. Um, 
that uh, they uh, April was while they still had the uh, disabled uh, flare, the uh, enclosed ground flare that we re uh, affectionately referred to the soup can uh, had heated up and had uh, had some structural integrity problems. And they said that they were going to wait to their next scheduled shutdown to do maintenance on it. Well, it seems that uh, it's uh, kept getting worse or whatever. We don't know. They don't explain to us, but they finally said, well, we need to do a, a um, shutdown. So they do what they call de-inventory. They um, uh, take all, should remove all their chemicals and stuff from the lines because if they're going to do work on the stuff, they don't want to cause explosions. Well, it turned out that uh, what they have is one of the byproducts of the of the cracking process is called uh, heavy liquids. And they wash the liquids with water and then they pipe the water over to the waste treatment plant to uh, get it cleaned up somewhat before they dump it excuse me, back in the river. Well, when they did that, they not only pumped the water over, but they pumped the heavy liquid over. And that went into the aeration tank and it started uh, producing uh, vapors. And in that process, they released quite a bit of, uh, of benzene, even though they did not uh, uh, tell us about that until a lot later. Um, the other thing besides the amount of va uh, uh, vapors and stuff of benzene that they had and 219 pounds, uh, you can read the malfunction report on the DEP website. Actually, the total amount was some 444 pounds, uh, but they also had almost uh, 200 parts per million of benzene into air at one time that they measured from April 11th to about April 18th. We were out there taking measurements. We were able to measure, uh, uh, have measurements on the bridge and also over by the Beaver Library. And uh, they also, uh, if you look at the report, there were like um, 500 pounds of an unspecified VOC. So they normally look for, as uh, Rachel always said, about 1,3-butadiene, hexane, naphthalene, toluene, and benzene, where there was another additional 500 pounds of unspecified. So that was quite a event. And again, very poor, poor communications and not letting us know what was going on. And uh, thanks to all of you alerting us to it and going out and taking measurements and stuff and sending it in. We finally did get a malfunction report with the data confirming what we had uh, observed. So they, um, they need to do a better job with when they have their incidences. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lau. And for our final two points, I'm going to turn it over to BCMAC board member, Rachel. Hi, everybody. Um, so number two, yes, they have 1,000 pounds of butadiene so far this year. 1,3 uh, butadiene is a chemical made from the processing of petroleum. It's a colorless gas with a mild gasoline-like odor. The Department of Health and Human Services, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and the EPA have determined that 1,3-butadiene is a human carcinogen. And studies have shown that workers exposed to it have may have an increased risk of cancers of the stomach, blood, and lymphatic system. Um, and you can read more about the symptoms of 1,3-butadiene exposure on the CDC's website, which we'll drop in the chat. So that brings us to number one. Shell struggles to remain compliant to their original permits. Um, so you've been hearing a bit about their trouble with emitting 
more chemicals than they are permitted to. Um, during the first three months of operations, the plant suffered from numerous issues that contributed to this, such as loose bolts and inc incorrect calibrations, unsteady amounts of gases, and a failed mechanical seal, and new equipment plugged with debris, as they explained it. Um, these malfunctions caused over 350 tons of excess volatile organic compounds or VOCs um, at the complex, including benzene and toluene. Shell exceeded its rolling 12 month total emission limits for VOCs from the beginning of October, uh, 2022. And as uh, you heard through the reports, um, through August, they've reported 989 tons of VOCs. It also exceeded its limits for carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, and hazardous air pollutants, um, and the benzene waste, as Dr. Lau dis discussed. Since September 27th, 2017, Shell has received 24 notices of violation from the DEP. And since January 1st, 2022, the DEP has filed 55 malfunction reports against Shell. Um, and we'll put the DEP website with more information about those in the chat. Government officials and the DEP promised Pennsylvania's good regulation, but instead of protecting Pennsylvanians, good regulation, but instead of protecting the health and safety of the residents, they've allowed Shell to pay to pollute. So Beaver County residents are the ones truly paying with exposure to thousands of pounds of toxic orga organic compounds. Um, now over 55,000 people have signed onto a petition to hold Shell accountable and you can too. So we're gonna drop the link in the chat and we would appreciate your support with that. Thank you, Rachel. And that leads us to our last um, part of this. We want to hear, you know, what surprised you today and what have you learned about Shell in the past year? So I am going to stop recording in a moment to protect your sa uh, health and safety and privacy. So please go ahead and raise your hand or um, drop something that you learned in the chat. <laughs> 